Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now, I chose um, Asma bint Abu Bakr because when I was thinking about, you know, who do I want to learn from, and there's so many incredible uh, women in our, in our tradition, but I realized I had very limited knowledge about her. And I thought, like, what do I know about her as, you know, someone who's clearly a figure in our tradition. And, she, and, and I thought, there's only a handful, maybe two stories that I can think of. So I intentionally chose her because I wanted to learn more about her. And this is where, you know, for all of you to keep in mind, we are students of knowledge. You know, we, we, we sit up here and we might seem like we're, you know, in this position of teaching, but we are actually always learning. And I know that we're always learning. So for me, I'm so grateful for these programs because they allow me the opportunity to also learn. So I am excited to share what I have learned about this extraordinary example for all of us. So she is Asma, of course, the daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, as well as Qutayla bin Abdul Uzza. And she was the first wife of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. She did not become Muslim. So they actually divorced before the Prophet's mission began. So um, she's the half-sister of, of course, our mother, Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, whose mother was uh, Umr Man. So just important things to know, because sometimes you hear that they're sisters, but that distinction is important. Now, according to Ibn Kathir, Asma radiallahu anha was about 10 years older than Aisha radiallahu anha, but others like Imam al Dhahabi uh, say that it was a much bigger, wide, wider age gap between 13 and 19 years. So um, Allah knows. But she embraced Islam at 11 years old. Are there any 11 year olds here? Any, anybody 11, 10 in that range? Anybody has a daughter that's 10, 11? I right, just think about, I mean, I have a 10 year old, soon to be 11. Think about what a precious time that is, and that, you know, subhanAllah, through her father, of course, uh, she embraced this faith. And I just thought, wow, she, you know, at such a young, tender age, she, um, the faith, you know, entered her heart. She's considered, uh, again, there's a difference of opinion, to be the 15th, some say 17th, some say 18th person to become Muslim in the earlier community. So she was prominent from the very beginning, she was there and she was like all the earlier converts, they would gather in Dar al-Arqam and study with the Prophet And in those earlier years, we don't know much about her life, but we do know that she marries another very important person who is um, Az-Zubair ibn al-Awwam, and who is he, radiallahu anhu. He is the son of al-Awwam ibn Khuwaylid, who is the brother of Sayyidina Khadija, our mother Khadija, radiallahu anha. So making her, um, him, um, her nephew, uh, say the Khadija's uh, nephew. And then his mother is Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, who is the Prophet's aunt. So that makes him the first cousin to the Prophet So she marries someone, again, from this incredibly noble, uh, from both mother and father, her lineage is very noble. And he um, is also considered the fourth or fifth male adult to become Muslim in that earlier community. So just a, an amazing pairing. And of course he, just FYI, he goes on to be part of the Ashara Mubashara, the 10 who are promised Jannah. So her husband is again an incredible, and he has his own story, uh, which one day inshallah maybe we can go into. But um, the Sayyidina Abu Bakr also brought him, by, by the way, also to Islam. So it's, kind of, it's really sweet, right? Like the man who would go on to be his daughter's husband came to Islam through him as well. Really beautiful. Now, um, their beginnings uh, as a couple were, were uh, difficult. Like many of that earlier generation, they didn't have very much. And uh, Zubair al awam was known for um, having just one possession when he came to ask for her hand, uh, which was a horse. He didn't have much else other than this horse, but of course his character, and that's why uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr gave him his daughter, because of his incredible character. So they had very humble beginnings, and Asma talks about that in her, um, you know, in her hadith. That she, she related some hadith, which we'll get to, but in some of those hadith, she talks about the challenges that she had as his wife, and just, you know, the struggles of, of the, uh, the life that they had, the hardships and the poverty that they endured. So during, right before the Hijrah, or at that time, she becomes pregnant with her first son, another very notable in our uh, tradition, Abdullah ibn Az-Zubair, radiallahu an. So she becomes pregnant with him, and this is when uh, the Prophet ﷺ and Sayyidina Abu Bakr 
flee, right? We know the story that they go to seek uh, protection in uh, Thawr, uh, Thawr and, uh, for three days and three nights. And so they're looking to keep this obviously under wrap with only trusted people. And, you know, it's a very, you know, secret mission. But she steps up to the plate of taking on the responsibility as a pregnant woman in her third trimester. Anybody here in their third trimester? Anybody? Oh, mashallah. So we have one, a couple of sisters. Now I want you to think about this. You know, we, uh, those of us who have had children, we know what the third trimester is like. You can barely walk, you know, a few steps without needing a break, right? Your back is hurting. You've got a lot of things going on. So just, I just was floored when you read the description of what she did in that state. We have to remember, I mean, we're, we're talking about the middle of the desert, Mecca, leaving the outskirts with um, people seeking to kill uh, the Prophet Sallallahu and her father, but she steps up knowing that she is also with child and she clearly is in, in her act showing where her love and her priorities and her hearts are. She wants to protect the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi and she wants to protect her father even at the risk of her own life and her own child's life. So this is an extraordinary woman who goes out. I want you to take a guess. Does anyone know how far um, Ghar Thawr is from Mecca. How, how far? Anybody get? Take a guess, and, and use miles. You know, everything I read was like kilometers. I'm like, I'm I'm an American. I don't I don't know kilometers. So miles, please. Anybody? <coughs> miles. What do you think? How many miles? How many? Twenty miles. Mashallah. Anybody else? Any other guesses? Ten. Very close. Close. Seven miles. Seven miles. She would walk. It took her about two hours in the blazing sun. As a third, as a pregnant woman in her third trimester, and this is where you know she again stepped up to the challenge. And she, what was her purpose? She she took them provisions, and she acquired this beautiful nickname because when she was putting together the provisions, she didn't have anything. This is again to show you how little they had. She had nothing else to tie the water, um, you know, the water. What is it called? The the, the leather water pouch, there's a term for it, but she didn't have anything to tie that or the food. So what did she do at that time? The women used to wear a waistband that would uh, you know, prevent their, their dresses from falling. So she took that waistband and she tore it into two. And this is where she got the nickname uh, that, that right? which is referring to the, the woman of two waistbands. Because when the Prophet saw what she had done when, he, when she came and she's you know, to untying her you know, waistbands and giving them the provisions, he uh, made a beautiful dot for her. And he said, indeed, Allah has given you. So the words are, are important to to pay attention to. Indeed, Allah has given you, in exchange for these waistbands, two waistbands in paradise. So he is indicating to her that she is in Jannah. She is guaranteed Jannah, which is, a, a, again, an extraordinary gift. So subhanAllah, this was her sacrifice, and she was, again, willing to take um, that, you know, that uh, trek into the desert, risking her own life, two hours, two hours there, two hours coming back, four hours for three days, right? Now, Fast forward, she, alhamdulillah, you know, makes hijrah as well. And on her way to Medina, she delivers her baby. That's how close to delivery she was. And she delivers in Quba. And this was a really great, extraordinary moment for the Muslims there. Because at that point, the Jews were, you know, they, were, they had uh, spread this rumor that they were cursing the Muslims so that they would, nobody would ever have a baby in Medina. So she was, her son, Abdullah ibn Zubair, was the first infant to be born in Medina as a Muslim. So it, again, another great honor for her. And so the Muslims are, of course, celebrating his birth. Now, again, for those of us who have had children before, instinctually we know immediately you get the baby, whether you're at the hospital or at home or however the birth is, and your instinct as a mother is to latch on nurse. So I want you to imagine how much strength it takes for a mother to again think of, like, what is best for my baby? Instinctually, I feel like I need to nurse him. But she was aware that what was better for her infant was to send him to who? None other than Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for him to perform tahniq, which is the process of taking a date and mixing it with his saliva and breaking off a piece and putting it in the mouth of the infant so that it promotes well-being and health and, of course, any, uh, any mixture of his 
uh, noble Mubarak, Mubarak's saliva is, is shifa for him. So she did that. And, you know, again, just put yourself in her place, like to, to know these things and to separate yourself from your child upon birth. It's not easy to do for everybody. But, of course, these are people who had um, a greater understanding, subhanAllah. So she goes on in Medina to become, again, a devoted wife, a devoted mother. She bears seven more children, subhanAllah. I mean, I have two, and to me, I, <laughs> I'm like, ah, and when I see anybody with two or more, I really, I'm just like in awe, but to imagine seven, subhanAllah, and again, in a time of, of immense difficulty, uh, but she went on and she did it, mashallah, and she spent her time um, just serving, serving her family. She was known to be incredibly charitable. This is one of her qualities that even her own son, Abdullah, uh, he in a hadith noted about her. He said that I have never known two more generous women other than my aunt Aisha, radiallahu anha, and my own mother, uh, Asma. Now, he made a, a really um, great observation in how they were different in their charity. And again, I want you to think about who matches your style more. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she was the type that would collect a good amount of money, right? So it's like she's saving, saving, saving. And then once she saved, or whatever it was, maybe it was food, then she would go and distribute it. But she had this habit of wanting to save it first and then at once give it away, right? So think, are you, do you follow that? Or do you follow Asma's example, radiallahu anha, which was to give it away immediately. So she didn't hold on to anything that was given to her. If it was an excess, she wanted to always give it away right away. So some of us, you know, we, we operate differently, but it's really nice to try to connect, like, where would I be in this spectrum, right? And so um, her uh, situation, as she, you know, lived with uh, Azubair in Medina and they you know, grew their family, actually turned around completely. He became one of the wealthiest men of Medina and then later Mecca uh, after the Fatah. So she was known then for feeding the poor and any time she got sick, which is a really good tip for us to think about. I remember my mother, Allah Alhamha, any time there was anything that happened to the family, her instinct was always sadaqah. She always had, she had, we had a, you know, on the mantle um, above the fireplace in her previous home, she had a Quran, and then she would have a place right next to it that she would put her money that she was going to give for sadaqah. But it was her habit, anybody sick, anything happens, uh, God forbid a car, car accident. And this was the way, um, and so how many of us do that? Right? How many of us think, again, as soon as something befalls us, that we need to look to purifying our, uh, our wealth and, and seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help and also thinking of other people, benefiting other people, right? It's very natural to think of yourself and want to preserve yourself in those situations. But subhanAllah, um, you know, people of a greater understanding again knew that no, you want to take care of others. So this was her way as well and she would feed the sick and she would free the slaves. So this was her habit if she was ever sick. She was also known for teaching fiqh of Hajj for the, uh, during the Hajj season. And these are facts that just, you know, for your information. She narrated a total of five hadith, alhamdulillah. Um, and you can, you know, if you're ever reading books, you might see, you know, narrated by Asma, which is an incredible honor. We really have to think about the fact that, you know, there are so many people around the Prophet but not everybody is in the hadith collections. And here she is narrating five hadith. She also is a warrior on top of all of this. She fought in the battle of Yarmouk. Uh, later on in life, subhanAllah, so she was, an, she was actually on the battlefield and they said she was a fierce warrior. And anybody want to take a guess what age she reached before she passed? Just throw out a number. 90, older. Older than 90 years old. 100 years old. And subhanAllah, the climax of her story and right before she passed away is one of the most incredible things I've ever read. Her exchange with her own son. I just, you just can't help but just be so in awe and humbled by these women. Because again, we live in a time where, where we don't have these living examples. I mean, you know, I'm sure there's beautiful women everywhere, but these stories, these epic stories, uh, bat fighting battles, you know, raising seven children, suffering so through famine and so many other things, um, uh, sanctions, and then to also live to 100 years old. But I'll get to that point in a moment about her, her end of her life. So there are a few really key lessons from her life that I just felt were really important to know in addition to all of that we just shared. 
The first, as was mentioned in uh, the description of this talk, was the hadith that a lot of us may associate with Asma uh, bin Zabi Bakr radiallahu anha, which is the narration where she entered the Prophet's home. This is according to Aisha radiallahu anha, her sister, and she was wearing a thin garment, okay, a see through garment. And at that time, the Prophet, this was again before the ayah of hijab was revealed, um, but she, the Prophet turned away from her. And then he said to her, Oh, Asma. When a woman reaches the age of maturity, it is not proper for her to show anything but this and this, and that was referring to her hands and her face. So this uh, hadith is really important for us to think about as women for obviously the context, because we live in a time, as we know, women are exploited constantly, and women's fashion, even what has been introduced in the uh, you know, fashion of, of muhajjabat, many things would be considered inappropriate and we have to just be real we have very clear boundaries in our sharia about what is acceptable and what isn't and this is why uh, this hadith is is something we have to pay attention to so when you get dressed you have to think about would i be someone that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would turn away from based on what i'm wearing right now i i mean i would i think that would be the most mortifying thing ever I would do anything for him to have one glance of his. So is it worth it to wear the yoga pants? No, sisters, it is not. Is it worth it to wear the see-through things that show your shape just because you want to keep up with the fashion trends and look really this or that? No, if it compromises your standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is not worth it. And that is why I so appreciate the grace and the beauty that Asma, she, she was in submission. She was in submission. She accepted it. She didn't challenge the Prophet Sallallahu And that's why we have to pay attention to the language of today, of the, the, the modern zeitgeist. It's all around these themes that are alien to our tradition. She wasn't triggered when he said that. She didn't take offense and personalize it and, you know, say, oh, the patriarchy. She understood this is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He, his entire life is for my salvation. So if he's going to tell me something to do or not to do, I will accept it. And she accepted it. And then, and then you know, the, the, the Mufassirin say that shortly after um, that the, the verse of, uh, you know, hijab was revealed. And the specific hadith relates to verse 31, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, um, minha, except for what is apparent, he goes, you know, tell the believing women to lower their gaze and guard their chastity and not to reveal their adornments, except for what is apparent. So it's she's she had, you know, subhanAllah, a part in this beautiful verse being revealed to us. So she's, again, an extraordinary example for us. Um, and so we want to think about that. When we are, if our spouses or if our parents are challenging the way we dress, um, we have to think about what is their intention. Sometimes it could be control, and there's no real, you know, noble intention. It's just control. But other times it actually is for your betterment. And it's good to question why. Not just what they're saying, but why are they saying that to me? You know, is it for some ulterior motive, or is it really because they're looking out for me? And nine times out of ten, inshallah, because you have, we, we want to always have the best of opinion of our parents and our, our family members and our loved ones, they are looking out for us. We just need to accept that and not question and have, you know, these doubts about everyone, which is what, again, the modern zeitgeist does. It just promotes this, you know, constant, you know, friction between us. So, really powerful um, uh, story about that. And there's, there's more, but for the sake of time, I'll go to the next point, which is her ghayra. This is also another really incredible lesson we can take from Asma. Asma was amazingly brave and courageous. She had real courage. She spoke out when, uh, whenever there was, uh, or, you know, I mean, we already saw, mashallah, what she did in terms of protecting the Prophet but even speaking to people and having the emotional intelligence and wisdom to know how to say certain things effectively, which is a tool, something we all need to learn. This is why grammar matters, rhetoric matters, our liberal arts matter, because we have to be empowered with language to be able to say things effectively. And she, in her discourse, in her dialogue, she was incredibly wise. So there's a story of her grandfather. So 
who is the father of, of, of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, his name is Abu Qahafa. So he did, had not yet accepted Islam when the Prophet and Abu Bakr migrated to Medina. He was still a non-Muslim. So he was really hurt that they fled because his grandchildren are left in, in his son's home without in his estimation, any care, and he kind of um, came into the house and said to his grandchildren, oh, your father has left you in a really terrible situation. He's, he's taken all his money at that point. Abu Bakr took all of his money, which some say was around 6,000 dirham or dinar, to help the Muslims. So he took his wealth with him. And so when he, the, her grandfather walks in, seeing the situation of his grandchildren, he immediately you know, uh, says these things in a way to um, bring doubt into their hearts about, you know, the, the, what, what her, their father did. But she had so much ghayra for her father and as well as the image of Islam and the Muslims that what did she do? He was blind. Okay, so he was blind. So she went and she quickly gathered a little bag and she put pebbles in it like stones, and then she put it in a, an area and covered it. And she took her grandfather by the hand. She said, no, grandfather, he didn't leave us without anything. Look, touch this. This is all the money he left us. So he was like, oh, okay, in that case, then there's no blame if he left all of that for you. But she had this beautiful ghayra, again, to protect the image of her father, protect the image of the Prophet and the Muslims to do that. And then another story comes out of when she was in Medina. So now, fast forward seven years after she's, uh, she's left and she is in Medina, she's an established mother, has her own family. What happens? Her own mother, remember her own mother, Qutayla, who had not yet accepted Islam, she's still, and she uh, dies in that state, she visits, the, uh, visits her, and she brings with her all of these treats and food and like ghee and raisins and other foods, and she wants to give all of these gifts to her daughter. Now Asma is conflicted, right? She's like, wait a second, even though you're my mother, you're still on the other side of this, and I need to make sure this is okay for me to even accept you as my guest and accept your gifts. So she had, again, that wisdom and that um, ghayra, deep ghayra for, for her faith to go and ask the Prophet ﷺ through her sister Aisha, can I accept my mother even though she is not a Muslim and she's brought me all of these gifts? And this is also really relevant, okay? How many of you are converts in this room? MashaAllah. Now, Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect and preserve all of you and inshallah bring hidayah to all of your loved ones. We had a sister here, I don't know if she's here, I don't want to call her out, but she was here yesterday for our dhikr that we did, and her heart was really heavy, she's a convert, and she said, I have no support system. And this is the situation of many of our convert sisters, which is why it's so important that we hold space with one another and that we bring our convert sisters and brothers into our communities and make sure that they never ever in their life feel that they have no support system. But we, all of us, and especially our converts, you owe Asma bin Abi Bakr a lot for what she did in this exchange. Because because of her and this situation with her mother and seeking the advice of the Prophet ﷺ, the ayah was revealed, which is, Allah does not forbid you from dealing kindly and fairly with those who have neither fought nor driven you out of your homes. Surely Allah loves those who are fair. This is chapter 60, verse 8. This ayah was revealed to reassure everyone whose family and loved ones have not yet adopted the faith that you can still have them in your life. You can still have a beautiful relationship with them as long as they're not forcing you out of their homes or, or torturing you or doing anything like that to, you know, again, bring them into your homes and, and, and treat them with the same love and dignity and respect. He gave that permission, and so she was relieved, and she accepted her mother. But another, again, incredible story that we get from Asma. The third is the story that she had with um, just such a powerful story, subhanAllah. So again, we're going to rewind a little bit when she didn't have a lot, and uh, you know, her husband, Zubair, was struggling, and they had this horse. At that time in her life, she did a lot. She, was the, she would go out early and get water for the horse, feed the horse, bring it fodder. She would walk it. She would go and get um, date uh, seeds, and they, they, would, they would at that time crush it. And it was a, pretty, a very labor-intensive life. And um, at one point, 
she had to walk about two miles to do this process of crushing these date stones and then they would carry these massive things on their head so I, again try to visualize this she's walking two miles exhausted she's been laboring all day just trying to make it survive and who comes and crosses her path none other than the beloved sallallahu alayhi wasallam and this is his sister-in-law so you know sometimes and this is again something that we should just really appreciate that is lost unfortunately today in the nonverbal communication that can sometimes be really powerful not everything always has to be said sometimes the states and the hearts are communicating so the prophet sallallahu alaihi sees his sister-in-law in this state without a single word he stops his camel and orders the camel to kneel and then he's, he makes a sound or something to that effect which was an indication to her like come on I got you sit, sit on the camel I'm gonna take you the rest of the way he had this compassion for his sister-in-law seeing her in this state but subhanAllah now I want you to see what she does this is again emotional intelligence of a wife and a woman who is using her intellect to assess the situation there's all these men here the processes here I could really use a ride, right? But my husband is jealous. I, I can't do it. Without words, without any words, what does she do? She just stands there. And the Prophet said, again, he knows the hearts. No communication. They just understood each other. He understood that her shyness meant she wasn't going to get on, and he just proceeded forward. And she went home, rushed home to tell her husband about this whole incident, what happened, because she wanted to be transparent. We, and we have to, again, apply this in the modern context. A lot of things are happening in spaces, private, in marriages, and lives all over the place. And everybody's all about privacy now. Give me a break. You're married? Transparency. You should have, you know, access to, to one another's, you know, whatever is, is public, right? But this idea that, no, I can do my own thing and I don't have to share. So just let's learn from her. She wanted to, again, show her husband that I honored you in your absence. So she tells him what happened. And his response is also really beautiful because it just gives us insight that they actually cared about one another. And it wasn't this whole, you know, power game all the time. Like, I want this and I want that. They weren't about that. They were about the hearts. So he told her, he said, by Allah, you're carrying the date stones and you being seen by the Prophet said, I'm, on, with that, you know, with it on your head in such a state is more shameful to me than you uh, having taken a ride with him. So he's letting her know, like, I'm pained that you were in this, that I've put you in this situation. I don't care about that. But they were so considerate of one another's feelings. So we have to think about that in the context of, you know, who are we, um, are we, you know, again, not sharing certain things with our spouses or are we taking these positions that are not really thoughtful about one another's feelings? And this applies to the brothers too. I hope they're watching this or will watch it at some point. But, you know, if your wife asks you not to uh, socialize with certain people, it's respect that you honor that request and vice versa. And I think we just have to, you know, uh, take, take that, uh, you know, nasiha from this. But she prioritized her husband's feelings in that incident. And then quickly, because I know we have, um, oh sure, thank you, Jazakallah Khairan, Sadaf Fadu Mashal, she's awesome. She reminded me to define the word ghayra. Ghayra is a type of jealousy, but it is a, a beautiful jealousy, right? It's feeling that, you know, you're, uh, to want to protect the honor of, of something or someone. So that's what, what that word means. Um, and it ap applied to the story before. But she had uh, immense ghayra and she was known for that. Um, I'm sorry, what, how much time do I have? I just don't want to, just so I know. What is it like? Five, am I done? Five minutes. <laughs> five minutes. Okay. Well, I'll try to finish this up as quickly as I can. Yeah. It's just she's got so many gems from her story, Subhanallah. But we received two really important hadith from her that warn about ingratitude. So that's why I think she's such a great role model for all of us. She. This is from her own narration. So she reports that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed by a group of women in the mosque one day. We're a group of women. Okay, just imagine this. We're all here, we're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet walks by and he waves. So beautiful. What, probably with the right hand. <laughs> he waved with his hand to greet them with peace and then he said, 
This is his nasiha to the women. Beware of ingratitude to those who bless you. Beware of ingratitude to those who bless you. And we know that the Prophet when he repeated something, he was driving a point home. He was trying to penetrate the hearts. And one of the women said, O Messenger of Allah, I seek refuge in Allah, O Prophet of Allah, from being ungrateful to Allah. And you know, she's seeking, like, what, explain. And he says, rather, one of you will be widowed for a long time throughout her middle years. Then Allah provides her with a husband, and he benefits her with a child, the joy of her life. Then she gets very angry, and she swears by Allah, saying, I've never, one good, I've never had one good moment with you. That is ingratitude to the blessings of Allah. That is ingratitude to those who bless her. That's one. And then another hadith, she also narrates that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, spend in charity and do not count it, lest Allah count it against you. Do not hoard it, lest Allah withhold you from you. So we learned, again, her way, according to her son, was that she would just give it away. So she's teaching us, be in a state of gratitude, don't deny blessings, don't magnify incidents, because these are shaitanic you know, thoughts. When you magnify an incident, and it overshadows a lifetime or years of experiences. This is what? What is it? Is it No. Thank you. Ghafran and Nama. Thank you. This is ingratitude directly because shaitan wants you to hyper, uh, again, focus on one thing that was said to you, one thing that was done to you, and that you negate everything else. May Allah protect us from that. We never want to fall under the category of those who are ungrateful. In fact, we want the opposite. We always want, because, you know, the opposite of gratitude is kufr. So may Allah protect us from that. And then to spend in charity and to give away without counting. So this is really great, Nasiha. Sometimes, you know, we are in positions where we might have to give. And if you're the type who is worried about giving away your wealth, this comes from, again, a lack of understanding. May Allah increase us in understanding that never... Are we losing when we give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Never is it a loss. It is always a gain. It is always an investment. So we want to, you know, really fight. Do that mujahid and nafs that we give. If, it, if you feel the impulse, just give and don't think twice about it. Don't let that internal conversation have, oh, maybe I'll just do half this time and then I can do it another time. And No. Nafs, shaitan work together to try to, you know, uh, prevent you from getting the maximum reward. So she's teaching us, right? Spend, don't count it, because then Allah will count it against you. And then, finally, and this is what I wanted to end on. Um, I mentioned one incident where she spoke to a tyrant of her time. They call him the Fir'aun of our Ummah, Abu Jahl, right? Um, or I might, I might not have given you the details. Sorry, I, I think I mentioned it, but I didn't get the details. So here's the detail of what happened. Abu Jahl, during the time when the Prophet and Sayyidina Abu Bakr were missing, he stormed into her house, and he demanded from her, where are they? Tell me, where are they? And I want you to, again, imagine, she's a pregnant woman. Pregnant, so vulnerable. There's no protector. Her father is not there. She stands up to him and says, I'm not telling you anything. I don't know anything. He slapped her so hard on her face that her earring fell off. And she still stood firm in front of him. And he realized, I can't get anything out of her, and he left. So that's one incident earlier in her life. At 100 years old, her son, Abdullah ibn Zubair, was uh, executed and crucified by Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf at 100 years old. And right before this incident happened where he was executed, they have this beautiful exchange. Her mother and son, he actually goes to her seeking counsel on what to do because he knew that if he fights uh, Al-Hajjaj, he's going to be killed. So he didn't know, should he surrender? Should he fight him? And this is a mother talking to her son, knowing that she's sending him to certain death. And she basically says to him, I would much rather you die a noble death than go and, you know, basically be beholden to this tyrant. So she, it gives him this encouragement and this nasiha, and it's this beautiful back and forth. And then he says to her, you know, about being afraid. He's vulnerable. This is his mother. And he says to her, I'm scared about being crucified after death. And she says, 
Skinning a slaughtered goat does not bring it pain. Off you go and seek Allah's help. 100 years old, sending her son to do the right thing. And he, she noticed that he was wearing armor, and he, she said, what, what are you wearing? Take that off. That's not the clothing of someone who's going in to, to martyrdom. You have to stand firm. So she gave her son that encouragement because she knew that that was, you know, his, he, he was already promised Jannah. She knew who, where he was going, and she wanted to give him that, you know, fight, like end his life in, the, in this beautiful way and not to cower to this tyrant. Now, Al-Hajjaj, of course, being who he was, he wanted to um, taunt her. So he did. He taunted her. And he called, he went and sent one of his minions to go get her and said, come, face me. Uh, you know, what did I do to your son? Basically taunting this 100-year-old woman. And she refused to see him. And then he doubled down and said, if you don't come, I'm going to drag you by your two braids. And again, she was firm and defiant. She's not going to capitulate to him. Finally, he had no choice but to go to her. And, you know, again, he's trying to taunt her. And she says to him something <laughs> so powerful. Remember this. She says, you may have ruined my son's dunya, but he has ruined your akhirah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. That is who Asma bint Abi Bakr was. She was an incredible force, a, a loving mother, a devoted wife, daughter, sister-in-law, everything. And she had this life of a hundred years Allah gave her. And now, alhamdulillah, here we are celebrating her life. And inshallah, I'm so honored again to have learned about her life with all of you. And I hope you'll learn more about her and all of the other wonderful sahabiyat and women around our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as we usher in this Mubarak month of Rabi Al-Awwal. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ha, ha, ha.